Good afternoon. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. So I'd like to just take a moment, and if you would, journey with me through the life of Ambassador James A. Joseph. The ambassador is emeritus professor of the practice of public policy and leader in residence for the Heart Leadership Program at the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. He is also founder of the United States Southern Africa Center for Leadership and Public Values at Duke and the University of Cape Town. He joined the Duke faculty in 2000 after a distinguished career in government, business, education, and organized philanthropy. He was appointed to senior executive or advisory positions by four U.S. presidents, including Under Secretary of the Interior by President Jimmy Carter and U.S. Ambassador to South Africa by President William Clinton. In 1999, the Republic of South Africa awarded Ambassador Joseph the Order of Good Hope, the highest honor bestowed on a citizen of another country. And in 2008, he was honored as a Louisiana legend and inducted into the Louisiana Political Hall of Fame. The founding chair of the Commission on National and Community Service that established AmeriCorps, he was honored by the United States Peace Corps in 2010 for his lifelong contributions to volunteerism and civil society. From 1982 to 1995, Joseph was president and chief executive officer of the Council on Foundations, which is an international organization of almost 2,000 foundations and corporate giving programs. After graduating from Yale Divinity School in 1963, Ambassador Joseph began his career at Stillman College in Tuscaloosa, where he was founding co-chair of the local civil rights movement. A frequent speaker to academic, civic, and religious audiences, he is the author of three books. He is a recipient of 19 honorary degrees and his undergraduate alma mater, Southern University, has named an endowed chair in his honor. He has also served as the chair of the Children's Defense Fund and as a member of the board of directors of the Brookings Institution, the National Endowment for Democracy, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, and City Year South Africa. One thing that was not included in what he sent me and he shared with me during our time together, which I've been most fortunate um, to have with him, is that he also chaired, he was chair of the faculty board for the Duke University Civ Center for Civic Engagement. So I hope that after having heard this, I, mean, I can't leave out the fact that Ambassador Joseph is married to the former Mayor Braxton and who is an Emmy Award winning television journalist and he has two children and two grandchildren. I hope that after having heard him speak today you will agree with me that he's great because he has definitely served. Join me and welcome Ambassador James Joseph. Thank you very much. I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of audiences in different parts of the world. So one of my favorite pastimes is listening to introductions. <laughs> they tell you something about the expectations of the host and also provide information that helps shape your message. When I was in the Carter administration, I was in the South Pacific to swear in the newly elected governor of one of the American territories. When I was invited to address a joint session of the legislature, just before I was scheduled to speak, I leaned over to the Speaker of the Assembly and said, Mr. Speaker, how long do I have to speak? And he said, to Mr. Undersecretary, you are our guest. You may speak as long as you wish. But I must caution you that in about 25 minutes, the lights are scheduled to go off across the island. <laughs> that seems to be good caution when people have been sitting for a while. Uh, but first, let me say what a, a delight it is to return to Tuscaloosa. I have not been back since 
1964, a year after three local ministers and I launched the Tuscaloosa Citizens Action Committee. Those were difficult and those were dangerous times, but the movement we organized not only desegregated this community, but opened the door for the many advances that followed. And I say that because we could not have done it without the students as Stillman. So when I think about civic engagement, higher education, and the public good almost 50 years later, I think of those students. And when I think of those times and today's theme, I'm reminded of the ancient historian Tacitus, who defined patriotism as praiseworthy competition with one's ancestors. Now, I recall that definition of civic virtue today because it reminds us that each generation has an opportunity, indeed an obligation, to contribute something as significant and even as extraordinary as the generations that preceded them. And so the questions I'd like to examine today are these. One, what role should higher educational institutions play in developing, nurturing, and sustaining the civic values that lead to civic engagement? Secondly, what do these institutions need to know and teach about the modern idea of civil society, especially the civic habits and traditions of the many population groups who are changing our civic culture? And three, what can these institutions do to help define and develop civic engagement as a strategic form of social change rather than simply a form of charitable relief. What I'm suggesting is that there should be three components to what we teach, what we research, and how we promote or facilitate civic engagement. The first has to do with civic values. The second has to do with civic knowledge. And the third has to do with civic habits. This encapsulates civic engagement into three powerful metaphors, being, knowing, and doing. Let me begin with the being or values component and offer the observation that an institution is what it rewards. I've been in business, I've been in government, I run a lot of organizations, and one of the things I learned is that an institution is not so much what it says in its value statement, what it says in its press releases, it is what it rewards its people for being. If civic engagement is an important university priority, there needs to be both guidelines and incentives that reflect what the university considers to be its values, what it claims as its values. It is not enough to simply provide incentives for students through service learning. There must be incentives to unleash the research capacity of the university as well. I was here and I heard what the President's panel said, and I'm so pleased that they represent institutions that get it. But as I travel around the country, I find an institutional culture that seems to regard practical investigation in the practical community needs, as Dr. Wilson said, as the dumbing down of research. Too many of our faculty colleagues tend to regard those who teach about civil society 
and those who call for civic engagement in Robert Louis Stevenson's phrase as practitioners of an obscure art. I'm pleased, as I said, that there are universities that get it. They are the ones who understand that one of the missions of a university is to put knowledge at the service of society. But one of the things I've learned over the years, that the best universities are those who also put the, university, the community at the service of knowledge. The second point I want to make about civic values is that we need to be very clear about what values we need to cultivate. I taught ethics at a number of universities. And for too long, those who teach ethics have focused on the private virtues that build character to the exclusion of the public values that build community. It may be that what we need most at this unique and almost apocalyptic global moment is to help both our students and our society understand how best to think about and how best to apply values to public life without getting caught up in the politics of virtue or the parochialism of dogma. I've been living in South Africa full or part-time for the last 16 years. And there's much that we can learn from a concept of community the South Africans call Ubuntu. It is best expressed by the Kosa proverb, people or people through other people. It is this powerful sense of the shared interdependence of people that lies behind the spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation reflected in the work of Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu. It is the ability to say that your pain is my pain that has allowed them to say that if your humanity is assaulted, my humanity is assaulted. If your dignity is denied, my dignity is denied. It is not, I think, therefore I am. It is, I am human because I belong. I participate. I share because I am made for community. At the heart of this spirit of Ubuntu is the willingness to take risk and to act justly and with compassion to one another. So what does it mean to speak of values that build community in a world that is integrating and fragmenting at the very same time? The more interdependent we become, the more people are turning inward to smaller communities of meaning and memory. While some find reasons for despair, it may be that remembering and regrouping are part of the first stage of the search for common ground. As I travel around the world, I hear more and more people saying that until there is respect for their primary community of identity, they will find it difficult to embrace the larger community in which they function. We will thus find it difficult to form a more perfect union in the United States as long as we emphasize the myth of individualism that leads to greed, to the exclusion of the tradition of community that saw people come together to build each other's bonds and to ensure that there was a public safety net for those in some way disadvantaged. The principle the second principle in which our idea of community needs to be grounded is one I often quote from the African-American mystic poet and theologian Howard Thurman, who was a mentor to Martin Luther King at Boston University. Dr. Thurman was fond of saying, I want to be me without making it difficult for you to be you. 
Can you imagine how different our world would be if more Americans were able to say, I want to be an American without making it difficult for Arabs to be Arabs, Asians to be Asians, and Africans to be Africans. Can you imagine how different our communities would be if more Christians were able to say, I want to be a Christian without making it difficult for a Jew to be a Jew, or a Muslim to be a Muslim, or a Buddhist to be a Buddhist. So how do we build community? It has been my experience that when neighbors help neighbors, and even when strangers help strangers, both those who help and those who are helped are transformed. They experience a new sense of connectedness. Getting involved in the needs of the neighbor provides a new perspective, a new way of seeing ourselves, a new understanding of the purpose of the human journey. When that which was their problem becomes our problem, the transaction transforms a mere association into a relationship that has the potential for new communities of meaning and belonging. In other words, getting people to do something for someone else, what John Winthrop called making the condition of others our own, is the most powerful force I know in building community. When you experience the problems of the poor or troubled, when you help someone to find meaning in a museum or creative expression in a painting, when you help to dispel prejudice or fight bigotry directed at a neighbor, you are far more likely to find common ground. And you are far more likely to find that in serving others, you discover the genesis of community. So the moral imperative of civic engagement is to help transform the lazy fair notion of live and let live into the principle of live and help live. This brings us then to the second question we need to ask. It is about civic knowledge. What should we know and what should we teach about the modern idea of civil society? Resurrected in the 1970s by the Polish workers' movement and late in debates about perestroika in the former Soviet Union, the idea of civil society is rooted in three very different visions of public life. The first was the idea of civil society as government. Civility for Aristotle described the requirements of citizenship rather than private sensibilities or good manners. It was organized around the face-to-face -face relationships of friends whose leisurely aristotic, aristocratic benevolence enabled them to discover, articulate, and promote the public good. The second is the idea of civil society transforming government, often in opposition to government. I was standing on the edge of a crowd in a former Soviet Union when an upstart named Boris Yeltsin made his first speech calling for major social reform. I was standing in a crowd outside of parliament in Cape Town when Prime Minister de Klerk announced that Nelson Mandela would be released from prison and the ANC on band. On each occasion, people spoke of the rebellion of civil society against the state. They did not so much want to replace the state as they wanted to transform it. The third idea of civil society has been the notion of civil society transcending government. Unlike the private sector driven by the market and the public sector driven by the ballot, the so-called third sector is driven by something deeper and more noble, a spirit of compassion and commitment to the common good. 
It is in many ways the conscience of the other two sectors. It is even possible to argue that since civil society preceded government, it may be more appropriate to think of it as the first rather than the third sector. The attractiveness of this concept of civil society lies in its conjoining of private and public good. But in what should be its finest hour, the idea of civil society is in danger of being distorted and hijacked by those who emphasize its potential in order to bolster arguments for a more limited so social role by government. Some of the strongest advocates of civic engagement are people with an own civil state of mind. While it was clear that it was people power that led to the collapse of communism, the dismantling of apartheid, and even the fall of the Berlin Wall, there are now those who exaggerate the potential of civil society in order to bolster their claims about the role of government. Those of us, and I spent 14 years as a spokesperson for benevolent wealth. Those of us who understandably and necessarily emphasize the potential of civil society have a responsibility to also point to its limits. Another of my concerns about civic knowledge, what we know and what we teach and what we research about civil society and civic values has to do with the many ways in which the American civic culture is changing. Alexis de Tocqueville, Robert Bella, and many others have painted wonderful pictures of what they described as the habits of the heart of the American people. Unfortunately, neither de Tocqueville nor Bella included in their reporting and analysis the extent to which voluntary activity and civil society in racial minority communities served as a vehicle for self-help, social cohesion, and positive group identity. As president of the Council on Foundations, 2,000 foundations from around the world, I cringed every time I heard some new guru on civil society speak of American voluntarism or American generosity if it was somehow unique to those citizens who traced their ancestry to Europe. Very disappointed in what I kept hearing, I began the research for the book I published in 1995 on the civic traditions of America's racial minority. What I found were remarkable manifestations of civic feeling that in many instances predated but was consistent with the civic habits practice and the civic values affirmed by the larger society. As early as 1598 and long before Cesar Chavez started organizing farm workers, Latinas in the Southwest formed lay brotherhoods to assist members with their basic needs. Long before the Tocqueville, Benjamin Franklin became so enamored of the political and civic culture of the Native Americans he met in Pennsylvania that he advised delegates to the Albany Congress in 1754 to emulate the civic habits of the Iroquois. Long before Martin Luther King wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail or gave his I have a dream speech, African Americans in the 19th century formed so many voluntary groups and mutual aid societies that some southern states enacted laws banning black voluntary or charitable activity. Long before Robert Putnam published his first article on social capital, Neo-Confucians in the Chinese community 
We're teaching their children that a community without benevolence invites its own destruction. The point I'm making it is that it is no longer possible to speak of American civic culture without reference to and respect for the very traditions that are now shaping our civic life. People around the world are coming to realize that a good society depends as much on the goodness of individuals as it does on the soundness of government and the fairness of laws. The events of the last uh, several decades have caused us to think often and deeply about whether transnational community is really possible. I am convinced that it is, but it will require us to think and to act differently. Our students who are engaged in community outreach locally and those who work abroad must be taught to respect local traditions, local cultures, and even local concepts of community. We come now to my final concern, what I have called civic habits. The idea that we tend to promote a rather limited approach to civic engagement. We are told with frequency that the world would be better off if more of us worked in soup kitchens, delivered meals to the elderly poor, or tutored kids who are at risk. Those are very important contributions. But they are ameliorating consequences when the university could help eliminate causes. The most often cited example of charitable relief is the story of the Good Samaritan. We are told that a traveler finds someone badly beaten along the side of the road and stops to help. Suppose that same man travel the same road every day for a week, and each day he found someone badly beaten at the same spot on the road. Compassion requires that he gives get aid, but eventually compassion requires that he ask, who has responsibility for police in this road? What started out as an individual act of charitable aid leads to a concern with public policy. The first response was to ameliorate consequences, but the second response must necessarily be aimed at eliminating causes. My second point about civic habits is that the university can help to inform and enrich the public policy process. I know that many of your institutions are advised by its donors and legal counsel that it is unwise, illegal, or too risky to get involved in public policy. I've served over the years on the boards of many universities, so I know from which I speak. But I also served on the U.S. Treasury Department's task force that struggled with how to distinguish between permissible advocacy and impermissible lobbying. And I can tell you that there is much that can be done by a university to objectively inform and objectively influence policy. And finally, a third point about civic habits is that civic engagement should mean investing in the empowerment of those who are economically and socially marginalized. The university can help educate its publics, both locally and nationally, on the policies and practices needed to make our society work for all of its citizens. But it is not enough to be simply advocates who speak in behalf of the marginalized in our communities. We must help empower them to speak for themselves. 
If racism was the original American sin, the persistence of paternalism is its most enduring counterpart. We have all too often asked the wrong question in dealing with those in our communities whom we seek to help. We have been asking, what can we do about their predicament? Or what can we do for them when we should be asking, what can we do together? I like the concept of assisted self-reliance or participatory empowerment, where the affected groups provide leadership, but they are supported by outside resources. Let me thus conclude by making the point that if you are to involve your students and your faculty meaningfully in your communities, they must understand that how they are engaged is as important as in what they are engaged. There's a story told about the exit of the British from one of its former colonies. On the day in which colonial officials were preparing to depart, the Governor General was overheard to say, when we came here, these people had few roads, few hospitals, and few schools. We built new roads, we built new hospitals, and we built new schools. But now they ask us to go. Why? A peasant, on overhearing the conversation, in interrupted to say, it is easy to understand, Your Honor. Every time you look at us, you have the wrong look in your eyes. Civic engagement aimed at eliminating poverty or advancing equity must begin first with a look at the policies and practices of our own institutions. Unless they have the right look in their eyes, your efforts will not only be in vain, but if left unattended, could damage your image, diminish your influence, and defer the dreams of those who give birth to the vision you seek to advance. And so we need to step back and ask, what assumptions, what social analysis lies behind civic engagement? What theory of change informs our practices and priorities? How often is the promotion of equity a consideration in what we conclude as successful? And finally, do we have an organized and disciplined way of learning what truly works in closing social gaps? When we provide answers to those questions, we may find that civic engagement itself may need to change. We cannot allow ourselves to become advocates of an obscure art, preoccupied with the potential of civil society and not its limits. Someone has to ask the difficult questions that too easily go unasked, and if asked, don't answer. I hope that you will be the one to return to your institutions and ask those difficult questions. Someone has to probe beyond the conventional wisdom that avoids controversy by closing rather than opening minds. You are a part of a great moment in history. I hope, therefore, that you will be able to elevate the idea of civic engagement to that of both a craft and a calling, both a discipline of study and a field of practice. Archimedes is reported to have said, Give me a lever long enough, and I can move the world. Those of you in this room have been given the lever. I hope you will use it to not only move your institutions and your communities, but to move the world. You are engaged in a very noble enterprise. For when you provide help, you also provide hope. And the gift of hope is as big a gift as the gift of life itself. Thank you very much.